I say, I say, I say, why should you never let Ipswich Town Football Club look after your dog? Welcome to the Blue Monday podcast. Good evening and welcome to the Blue Monday podcast discussing all things Ipswich Town up or down since 2015. My name is Craig Fimbo and this is the live flagship show on a Sunday evening. Good evening to you all. Joining me this evening for a look at the first 96 minutes of the Charlton match is Joe Fares. How are you Joe? I'm good yeah a bit of a rush. I've been out for dinner for my youngest's birthday and the clock's going back. It's confused things. So I've literally just walked through the door, sat down, managed to pour myself a nice cold pint of orange squash and ready to go. Oh, fantastic. Well, what, what, what age birthday are we looking at? Four. So a pretty big one still, obviously. And, and is, is, and, and where was the um, restaurant of choice? Oh no, it was just, it was just at my parents. I just oh, went there, but with my sister and her kids. So it's just been four screaming young kids running around sweat dripping from every pore sliding on knees fantastic stuff good 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 um and we're also expecting our finnish correspondent but he is yet to join the stream he's having technical issues in joining us um so we'll say hello to mikey as and when he um jumps on the stream are you currently in the the denial phase joe or, the, or they're still in the disbelief phase Oh, I don't know. I don't know all the stages and what order they come in, but I, I, I say I'm fairly philosophical about it, which might not get the ratings needed. But I say you can't get too angry about these things, can you? It what was you one of those I... ones that, off, off the car home, sort of. There's three of us in there, and every five minutes, everyone would just all of a sudden, just from nowhere, would be like, "For f sake," sort of thing. As the memory of what has happened comes back to you, there just. You're sort of sitting there concentrating and dreaming about something else, and all of a sudden you think, "Oh God, we have just thrown that away again today, haven't we?" Twice, yeah. Michael, how hello, are Craig. You? I'm right? very well, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I've just had a, a slight technical issue. I, I yeah. wasn't late. No problems. Um, well, yeah, I am late, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> these are the these this, these these are the facts. So you're right, though, mate. You got home okay yesterday afternoon. Actually, all three of us were there yesterday. You got your. You, yeah, oh, I, well, you need to tell us when you actually left, because as far as you're concerned, it was a, a fantastic 4-2 victory, wasn't it? Yeah, so I needed to be back pretty swiftly yesterday, um, and I wouldn't have left at 3-2. But once we scored the fourth, I thought, yep, this is perfect. <laughs> and I started skipping down the road. <laughs> and, and weirdly, I didn't, well, spoiler alert, I didn't even hear the third goal. Um, so the first, so I... Then suddenly Charlton fans started celebrating around me. Um, and yeah, they were sort of celebrating, but also cursing the fact that they'd left early. So it was kind of the opposite for me because, yeah, I I didn't really miss much, did I? <laughs> no, well, we, we may go through that later on. Who knows? Mm. Um, right, let's get a few shout outs to some people who have decided to join us this evening. Good evening to you, Charlie, as ever. And Dan is saying good evening back to Charlie. You can say good evening to us as well, Dan, if you wish. Veronica is here with us as well, as is Tony um, and our Australian correspondent joining our Finnish correspondent. We have Michael all the way from Brisbane. Kirk's here, as is Flim Flam, as is Mullet. And yes, do you know what, Mullet? I was, as I was watching that fourth, well, initially the fourth goal and then the eighth goal go in, I was thinking very long along similar lines you know unbelievable you were probably thinking it as well when you bought me a six pound 75 pint at london bridge craig <laughs> well i wasn't gonna i was gonna mention that mike but now now you have you know it, were, were you on the neck or were you <laughs> it was something similar to that wasn't it but yeah. wow no, that was nice wasn't it? that was nice to me yeah, Borough a, Market. Nice we, were in, we were just a little bit yeah. above uh the um the london bridge hoi polloi um mm. well, not above in ge <laughs> geographical terms but uh I think we were yeah. above it. Yeah, it's lovely. One of my one of my friends drove up, so we had um, we had to find somewhere in Charlton to eat, and there's just nothing in Charlton at all. Mm -hmm. And we ended up in this like really small Thai restaurant for a I had a chicken massman curry for a pre match <laughs> meal with a couple of pints <laughs> of cigar because it was like the only place there. And I was like, yeah. I'll get a table and have a couple of beers here. So it sort of did the trick, really. But it was a, a strange well, suppose... pre match. 
Well, I suppose the good the good thing about that is, Joe, you now haven't got to cement that in as your pre match ritual, have you? Because you might struggle to do that for uh, <laughs> for future home and away games. Yeah. Have a word with the hospitality people in uh, the Sir Bob Robson suite. Um, yes, good evening to you, Jules. Good evening, David. Hello, Eric. Um, yeah, there's a there's a lot of people in the chat. So yeah, please forgive me if I don't get round to um, to highlighting your uh, particular comments. But we will obviously get through things um, in a matter of course. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of people with a lot of comments, a lot of questions, bits and pieces like that. So, you know, please feel free to uh, to put your comments in. Um, as ever, we'll go through the the match action, what there was of it, um, and then welcome your, your comments and questions. Um, before we get to that, we'll have a quick look at the, the week's news. Um, and it was sad news this week, actually, when it was announced that the Supporters Club chairman, Martin Swallow, had passed away. I know Rich and Seb um, covered it on a Friday evening, but just additionally, there were some lovely tributes, um, which obviously point to... You know, a good man who did good work for the for the club and the relationship between the, uh, the fans, the supporters, uh, and the club itself. And I think I can speak for everyone on behalf of the pod just to pass on our uh, condolences to Martin's family, family and friends. Um, so yeah, sorry, sad news um, on that regard. Um, another piece of news this week, which Seb and Rich hospital passed. I don't know if there's a, an American football equivalent of a hospital pass. Um, but there was a link, or the and link was announced that the club have now um, a relationship with Tom Brady's wellness brand TB12, and as we all know, Tom Brady's a seven-time Super Bowl champion. Um, now I'm going to say some words of which I don't understand, but TB12 is a holistic health and wellness company, which is modelled yeah. on Brady's own training training regime. And it's got five pillars and the same five pillars that the Blue Monday podcasts tend to lead their lives with. Pliability, yeah. nutrition, hydrate, well, hydration, certainly, movement and mental fitness. Joe, what is this all about? You're our resident gridiron expert. Well, uh, Tom Brady, uh, uh, in American sport, obviously, he's a quarterback and you're almost the a very sort of individual role in the team. Even though you're the biggest part of the team, you are the absolute main man in almost like in any team sport there's no one more important than a quarterback in american football and he's always had this trainer who this is set up with this alex guerrero who has all basically been his personal trainer nutritionist and anything that goes through the team goes through this guy instead and it's sort of caused some issues over times in the past but ultimately i think he's what 43 he's still well this season he's not been great but he's um but up up until this season he's sort of been sort of the best quarterback for probably 15 years or in the top three for that whole period and is supremely fit and it's all I don't know it's that holistic wellness almost that sort of very west coast American thing isn't it and mm. where you're yeah, eating he, avocado he eats... ice cream with buffalo milk mozzarella <laughs> and yeah he eats an anti, anti-inflammatory diet doesn't he like they, I don't think he even eats tomatoes because he considers it, considers them to be like a flammatory yeah. food well, yeah catch fire <laughs> so yeah so I, I i don't know what the link is but obviously he's his trainer has found a way to monetize his knowledge base that has led to one of the greatest sort of careers in sport effectively and the greatest durability and fitness in sport so obviously there's there's something there and it's yes yeah, it's, it's exciting isn't it you're, you're linking up it's still it still seems that america's a long way ahead of england in sports when when you look at players doing rehab knee operations they all seem to still go to america don't they and yeah. have that and do the rehab there so yeah can't hurt it's yeah it's another exciting development and something that seemed a million miles away under the previous regime where we didn't even have like gps vests in training when you get those things in like the isthmian league let alone let alone having this sort of set up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I say, we'll, we, may, we may not see, you know, t physical, tangible benefits of it, but, you know, in the background, they'll, they'll be, I'm sure, um, consultants. I think they've read somewhere that there's a guy going to be coming in bi-monthly, whether that's every two months or twice a month, I'm never quite sure, but bi-monthly to come up the training ground and act as a consultant and bits and pieces like that. Um, right, just a quick one. David? You don't need to be doing this, my friend, but thank you very, very much for your uh, for your generosity as as ever. Um, Cheers, David. Righty ho, shall we, gents? Um, now we don't want your sympathy, but we've had to 
relive this match to get to the highlights and sort of work out what uh, what went on because it was complete mayhem in the second half and I'd forgotten at least half of it. So I need to shout out to uh, to Phil and his TWTD um, match report, which helped me not not sort of add any logic to what happened, but certainly get the uh, the the timeline right in my own head. Um, <clears throat> so. We travelled to Charlton and we made, I think it was three changes to the uh, to the lineup from Port Vale on Tuesday. Um, Sam Morsey obviously returned to the to the midfield alongside Don Ball, uh, and there was more tinkering with the front line. We went with Jackson and Chaplin, sort of wider and slightly withdrawn, maybe from John Jules in attack. Any surprises there, Mikey? Morsey and Ball, the correct I, partnership I, in the middle. Yeah, I think. A lot of us would have liked to have seen Humphreys play, but at the same time, completely understood why Ball got the nod instead. Um, difficult away game, and there's some decent, well-travelled centre midfielders for Charlton. So, and obviously, all of the effort that Humphreys had put into that game. So that that one wasn't a surprise at all. And it, they're never really like big shocks anymore, are they? But Jack Jackson coming in when Edwards had played so well the other night, maybe a little bit of a shock. And the Dapo as well scored two goals, and then finds himself on the bench. It's strange because at the start of the season, Adapo wasn't scoring and seemed to seem to always get the nod. And now now he is scoring. <laughs> it's sort of um he plays horses for courses um up front, doesn't he? But but yeah, John Jules sort of came in and, and did pretty well. Yeah, I suppose it you know it would have been sending the wrong sort of message to Don Ball to drop, you know, a guy with hundreds yeah. of championship games, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, under his belt. And um, you know, if you are going into the away game, it's a pretty Solid, um, aggressive uh, central midfield pair, isn't it? Um, yeah. Joe, anything you'd have done different at the in the front line? No, not really. It, it does seem that John Jules and Jackson seem to come into the team as a pair, don't they? Whenever, yeah. whenever we have a sort of an away game like this against a better side, maybe it does seem that we always put John Jules and Jackson in the side to, I guess, stretch them and go from there. So I, I, I was half expecting it, but obviously Ladapo scores two goals on Tuesday. You can feel yourself aggrieved to not be starting, yeah. but him and John Jules just seem to share it and one plays six and the other plays 30 most weeks, don't they? And they must both be on board with that. Yeah. Yeah. And for Charlton... You... Go on, sorry, go on, Mikey. Sorry, I was just going to point out the average age there. Um, aside from Keo, that's probably our oldest team, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose... I suppose... Well, Don the Dapo could have been in up front. Evans is but... still a dumb ball, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's unusual um, for us to be older than the than the opposition. Yeah, well, I suppose I suppose I don't know if that's in line because um, Charlton had a debut, didn't they? Thomas at the back was, I think, making his full okay. debut um, in place of Ryan Innes, who got sent off against MK during the week. Um, anything else there? There was Sean Clare was wearing some sort of. Motorbike helmet, I think, at uh, right fullback. Well, it didn't seem to be had, like one of those minimal masks that uh, yeah, it was big, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like a full head, wasn't it? Full head helmet he was wearing. Yeah. Um, Stephen Sessignon was there from Fulham, he played well, I thought. Mm. Um, he kept uh, West Burns pretty quiet, didn't yeah, he? he did. Um, yeah. and the uh, Woodward household favorite Scott Fraser there in uh, in midfield, um, complaining when anyone dared try and tackle him for. The uh, mm. first half, at least, and up front, they had a rather isolated, I thought, Jaden Stockley um, and statuesque, really. He, 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 oh, I say he does just look the archetypal bang average League One striker, doesn't he? Yeah. Doesn't really have anything about him at all. Sort of thing. I'm, and I'm sure he'll, he'll score like 15 goals or something just by virtue of playing every game. But yeah, I was really unimpressed with him because he's sort of a player that I've sort of seen in the past. Oh, he looks like a player that could step up. You can see why when he went to Preston the Championship, he didn't last long there. Yeah, he didn't look very mobile, did he at all? He was he was very very um, pedestrian up front. I say he didn't get a lot of so, a lot of assistance, but yeah, he looked pretty no. um, immobile. Um, rather than he was more immobile than immobile. Um, so in, in nice. the very thank you in the very first minute, um, Christian Walton almost gifted a goal to our, our friend Stockley, didn't he, Mikey? He was, it was literally in the first 30, 40 seconds of the game, wasn't it? Yeah, he took he took a bad first touch, didn't he? And then and then an even worse pass. But you're thinking, yeah, he, he has been doing that quite a lot recently. I know obviously it is going to happen because we are playing out from the back. Um, so it's not always going to be perfect. But Walton has got a little bit lucky a couple of times recently where he's 
he hasn't played it out from the back very well early on in the game. Um, but yeah, at that stage, you're thinking, Cray, yeah, he's just getting his one mistake for the game out of the way. And yeah, no harm done, nil-nil. <laughs> Yeah, and it, and to be fair to Charlton, they did they did press us you know, very high up, didn't they? And they, they did, weren't yeah. they weren't giving him an out ball, were they? Really, it was it was pinged out wide to Burns on the right wing, wasn't it, Joe? That yeah. that was literally our, his only out ball a lot of the time. Yeah, and it, I say it was became a sign of things to come, didn't it, from his overall performance? But he just sort of seemed to drag his studs over the ball, didn't he, when he tried to pass it? And luckily, Stockley wasn't particularly aware of what was going on because he had time to really have a proper pop of goal there, but just sort of scuffed the shot back to him. But that was a, I say a real, a real wake up there, wasn't it? When we were sort of yeah. watching from the behind and that goal. Yeah, absolutely. Just another quick one from Nathan. Nathan from Melbourne. Good morning to you, Nathan. I hope you're okay. Um, it's not a problem whatsoever. It's, it's therapeutic, my friend. We don't mind doing it. Um, but uh, I'm glad to hear that these clock changes like this time of year, once we're jumping backwards and you guys are forward and backwards and there's, like big swings in uh, time time zones. Good to uh, good to have you on board, and thank you very much for your uh, your generous generous donation. Um, Don Ball got booked rather early on, didn't he? Ten minutes, I think, 10, 12 minutes. He got booked, um, but apart from that, it was a pretty uneventful first twenty five minutes. I say that Charlton were Charlton were pressing. Um, we weren't really getting the ball to stick up with John Jules. He then started to sort of drift a little bit deeper and, and wider, didn't he, at, uh, at points, but yeah. we weren't really getting in amongst them up in the final third. So, yeah, first 15 to 20 sort of felt like both sides just sort of feeling each other out, or us maybe more feeling them out in that period, because after that I just felt it sort of got to a stage, like, oh, actually, we're, we're better than these, we're just going to get on top, and we just sort of slowly sort of turned the pressure up a little bit, and the game then started taking place fully in their half, and they weren't really having a kick in our half after that sort of, outside that first 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, and then 35 minutes, there was a whistle in the crowd and all the players sort of momentarily stopped. And then two or three minutes later, John Jules was actually through one-on-one and something, you know, we may not have heard the whistle at our end, but it, it certainly seemed to put him either off his stride and, and momentarily stopped when he was running through and the defender sort of caught him up and I think eventually knocked out for a corner. But so I, ref- I, didn't, I didn't hear that second one. The Jackson went, because they passed it through to Jackson and almost like whistled him for offside before the ball had got to him. And I was like, what on earth was that? And we all sort of looked around and it was, it was a clear whistle as well, wasn't it? The first yeah, really, time. really clear whistle. And um, you just thought, well, what, what, what has gone on there? And then play just carried on and there. So you just sort of didn't really think of it. And then, but when John Jules went through, I, I didn't hear it that time myself, but obviously it happened, but yeah, there was a comical tannoy announce. It wasn't it. It's like, whoever's got a whistle in the crowd, if, if you blow it again, the referee will have to call the players off, so stop it. <laughs> yeah. You're all going to be kept behind after the final whistle until we find out who it was that did it. So you're punishing everyone for your uh, for your misdeeds, yeah. Um, and the ref did actually, he caught, you know, he went and spoke to Morsey, he went and spoke to the Charlton captain, he spoke to both managers as well, I think, um, to, to point it out. Um, and that was, I say, pretty much it until the final knockings of the first half. And, you know, unbelievably, there was a, a goal in injury time um, in this match in the first half. I don't know if everyone can remember back that far. Um, but slightly previous to that, Joe, something else happened in the lead-up, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. It's <laughs> comical, isn't it? But, yeah, so John Jules does brilliantly. Sort of ball comes into the box. He beats a man, opens up for all the world, looks like he's going to score. And then hits the shot a goal, and it goes behind. But... John Jules, Morsey, Chaplin, all just fly over to the ref, sort of appealing for handball. But I sort of asked a couple of people who watched it on iFollow, is there a replay of it? And I couldn't really see anything conclusive. And then all of a sudden, sitters messaged me on Twitter, this photo that's on the screen now. And it is, the referee's looking straight at it. It's as blatant as you can get. The keeper's getting nowhere near it. No. Would, that, would that be a red card? I, I, I presume so. I, I presume if the ref does his job there, that's a red card and a penalty to us. And But obviously, Terrell Thomas didn't go on to have any other impact in the game. But it, sort of, it, it gets forgotten about, though, because we scored directly from the corner, brilliant corner from Davis. Edwards gets across his man and powers ahead of home. But yeah, that's, a, again, a massive moment. And another another team, like the Sheffield Wednesday game, where... 
the away fans or the home fans, sorry, as it was actually for Wednesday as well, going away screaming about the ref mm. when he's made a massive error in their favour, like a huge error in their favour, mm. like that is there and like the Sheffield Wednesday goal was. Yeah, no, absolutely. But as, as you say, you know, from the subsequent corner, it's a, a good cross and we're starting to get the habit of scoring from set pieces, aren't we, Mikey? We are, yeah. And it was, it's it's the like the flight of the delivery because I think sometimes you will hit the first man when you're trying to do that, trying to whip whip one in with with lots of pace um but yeah they've obviously worked worked on the sort of standard set pieces on the training ground as well as the the short corners but yeah it was just such a good delivery but Edmondson times his jump really well as, as well that's, that's not an easy skill to do but he sort of got across his man got up really well flicked it in I think the goalkeeper got a touch but but it was um it was too much power on yeah. power on it yeah. wasn't there and it's good to see Le- I know he's been doing it for two or three weeks now but Leaf Davis is continuing his metamorphosis into Aaron Cresswell, isn't he now, by starting mm. to take um, take set pieces. Uh, yeah, he was maybe a, a, a left-sided Trent Alexander-Arnold at times um, yesterday. I felt, I felt where he was really good at times going forward, then a, a few loose passes, and yeah, as we'll get to it, not, not fantastic defending this time. Yeah, back post. But that was pretty much it for half-time. I think we, we edged it, as you say, Joe, you know, from... Certainly the last 20 minutes or so of that half, we were in the ascendancy, certainly from a territorial perspective. We were getting a lot of corners, weren't we? And we pretty much camped in their in their box, weren't we, in their half? Yeah. It was just, yeah, like all over them, really. I thought I thought we were not at our fl- most fluid best, but I thought we were just really dominant, sort of getting into positions and started that way in the second half as well, I thought. Yeah. Certainly wasn't certainly wasn't worried at half time. I felt no. Very well, you sort of, half-time. yeah, you sort of think now, don't you? That once we get into the well, did think once we get into the lead, yeah, we we can start just managing games and keeping control of games and the ball and sort yeah. of seeing them out, um, especially certainly, with, especially with Morsey and Ball in the middle as well. Well, yeah, exactly, and so it's a lot of old heads with a lot of experience um, behind them, um, and that was even further um, emphasised on fifty-two minutes, Mikey, when. The aforementioned Don Ball was fouled and there was a, a free kick afterwards. Yeah, so it was in a, a really good position for for Chaplin or Leaf Davis. I guess Chaplin still gets the nod, doesn't he? Because he scored a really good one earlier in the season. And I was looking at John Jules because I was, I was behind the goal, very central and quite near the front. Um, and I was looking at John Jules thinking, oh, he's standing very close to the wall. I And I was expecting him to try and run across the goalkeeper to try and get in his line of sight, but sort of tuck in with the wall. But <laughs> he doesn't quite do it. And Chaplin's tried to tried to hit a really low one. He was just trying to pick out that that far corner, probably a free kick where you're more hoping that the, the goalkeeper spills it and you get a rebound rather than it going in directly. Um, but <laughs> as it happens, he strikes it perfectly well. And John Jules... I thought it was quite a weak just, strike. I don't think he caught it that he, well. Yeah, but then look, looking at it again, I don't think it was a miss hit. It was just maybe one that just, it wasn't, an absolute rocket, but he's he's got it past the wall. Um, goalkeeper may well have thrown his hat on it if it if it did make it through. But either way, John Jules gets in the way, but gets such a strong touch on it that it sort of ricochets off towards the corner. And Chaplin, to be fair to him, not a great free kick as you say, Joe, but dashes over and gets the ball straight away, and has the presence of mind to then pull it back. And Wes Burns has sort of got into that. Lee Evans' position, hasn't he? Right mm. out on the on the right touchline and whips in a, a nice cross, but one that you fully expect to go to the goalkeeper. But John Jules has gambled on this occasion and gets across the goalkeeper and glances it in. Really nice header. Um, two nil, game over, job done. Yeah, lovely stuff. But that, and this and this triggered the ire of. Uh... Bengana, didn't it? He went absolutely apoplectic. Yeah, was it line. was it over the free kick decision? Do you think, Joe, or or was it because he thought John Jules was offside? Well, Which he was, John, I think. Well, John think? Jules was offside, but it's it's not offside by far enough for him to have noticed it that quickly to have been that irate about it. But he he, he didn't think it was a free kick on ball. But for me, Dobson may get the ball, but he sort of goes through the back of ball to get it. But yeah, obviously we're looking at it from the angle behind the goal so you're not seeing there but he he can't win the ball from where he is can he and yeah now he was he, he was running I was to myself and Oscar my boy we were to the right of the goal to, more towards the corner flag and so ball was sort of running in our direction and he does 
as ball's running towards us, he takes out his legs to get mm. to the ball, which was on the other side of, of the tackle, if you like. So it was a free kick for other than a see. But, and as you say, Joe, there's no way in the world he would have known that John Jules was offside because he was remonstrating as soon as the goal went in. He was, and he went absolutely mad. Yeah. And he didn't seem to row back on it at all in his post-match comments, did he? No. When he talked no. about the... well, yeah, we'll we'll come on that, come to that in a sec. But he he took a lot of persuasion, didn't he? As well, to once he'd received the red card, he didn't sort of turn on his heels and wander off down the, the tunnel either, did he? He was um, very it's reticent. Just strange. To... It's like a for me. I, I said at the time, which obviously has come back to bite me a little bit, but it was like he'd just been totally found out by us as a team. We were just all over him. So he was sort of trying to make out to the crowd that he cares and he's got passion to go for it there just to sort of try and win some sort of curry a bit of favour back from the fan base because he's just sort of been totally found out at home for the second time that week. But obviously bit they a, came back, so it wasn't quite, didn't quite end like that. But Bit of a Paul Lambert moment, wasn't it, at, at Norwich? That's what it felt like to me. Around. Very fake, very, yeah. very planned, very sort of just trying to get the fans on side mm. for what was going to be a defeat so that he could get the them saying how bad the ref was, even though he denied a sort of stonewall penalty to us sort of 15 minutes before. And Well, this was it. And that's exactly what I was going to say. I, he reminded me of Ian Holloway. I know he's worked with Ian Holloway. He just looked like Ian Holloway as he went dancing off down towards the tunnel and the you know, trying to get the crowd going. But as you say, Joe, he seemed to have chosen to forget that there was a handball and potential red card seven minutes previous to that. But, you know, we'll... Well, if you dress like a fan, you behave like one. Today. Oh, <laughs> he was in a in a white sartorial hoodie, sartorial <laughs> advice from uh, from Mikey. <laughs> I didn't notice what he was wearing, mate. To be perfectly honest with you, I'll, I'll take your you're obviously you're closer to him over that side of the uh, yeah. pitch. Um, <laughs> sixty two minutes. It's probably quite a um, a pivotal moment at the game when um, Charlton made a couple of subs and Stockley and Kirk, uh, who are both pretty quiet, uh, went off. Um, and Chuck Sanike came on with um, Blackett Taylor. And one minute later, they had a pretty immediate impact, didn't they, Joe? Well, Anike is a quality player, but he just cannot stay fit, get fit, play 90 minutes week in, week out. I so say you look back at his stats for the last, I think for the last four seasons at Charlton, he's sort of scored a goal, sort of 0.86 goals per 90 minutes. I think it was when I looked earlier. And But then he's only started sort of like 16 games in those four seasons and another 50 or 60 sub-appearances. He's just unable to get fit. But yeah, the ball, ball goes down the right. He tries to, um, I don't know, it's, it's another one where Edmondson sort of seems to get himself in a decent position. And it's sort of, I don't know, I think you get that free kick most of the time, don't you? He's he's in front of him and Anike just puts his hand on his shoulder and sort of drags him down. But then puts the ball across and it's a good save from Walton, makes a good save, but the ball drops to Raksaki and he takes a touch and is able to able to just force it home. But again, like my instant reaction to it was almost like, well, we're so much better than these. I don't, I don't care almost. It's almost that I'd have scored. They're not going to score again. We'll probably score. They won't. It just seems such a sort of strange atmosphere in that side. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't remember actually in the first half because there was a lot of noise up our end, obviously, but I didn't, didn't know if there was any booing from Charlton. But if there was, it may well have been towards the referee actually thinking. Of, thinking yeah, it was one of those boo, boo or boo ones. Yeah, quite. Um, and then John Jules had a header pretty much immediately after that goal, didn't he? And you'd have been right. it had been right in front of you, wouldn't it, Mikey, this one? Yeah, I couldn't believe he didn't score, to be honest. You could see his eyes, another... couldn't you? Could you? It yeah. landed on his head. Yeah, it, it may be a little bit unfortunate. It was one where they he perhaps has just tried to make make sure he got a good contact on it, which he did. Um, but it was just a, it was a wicked ball in again, wasn't it? Um, but yeah, he got to score. Jackson did well there, and in, in, that was probably his brightest bit of play, wasn't it? He ran that channel nicely, but then had the composure to cut back and play the ball backwards. And John Jules again, to be fair, like, yeah, he he hasn't scored and he should have done. Um, and it was definitely a harder chance than the one that he scored from, albeit from an offside position. Um, but good movement um from yeah. John Jules to his to his credit, which like he, he a player of his size, he should be able to score his fair share of headers. And he and he definitely will if he keeps making those runs. But yeah, a bit of a sister that one. Yeah. Yeah, but you think John Jules in the game yesterday, he's got three big chances, hasn't he? One he's created for himself, taken it perfectly, but it's been punched away by the defender and unlucky there. Brave scores ahead in that third one. 
I say it just seemed that seemed the easiest of the lot, didn't it? Once he was in that position, and mm. you, you could see his eyes light up because I was sort of right behind Mikey, you'd see it just his eyes light up as it's coming across from Davis and got up really high, but heads it down, good connection, but heads it straight at the keeper's feet, doesn't he? And I think it, a little bit to either side of him, and he's probably going to score there. But I think at that point we were really starting to get on top. Jackson was working that he was the space was really open up for Jackson down that left hand channel, probably right in front of where you were, Craig. Just mm. sort of getting in there time after time on that side. But then we made the sort of the changes at that point, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. 71 minutes. We made our three subs. Um I do sometimes wonder if this is a little bit formulaic and you know, we're gonna make these subs regardless of um match situations or or potentially player performance. Um, at that particular time. Um, and mm. Chaplin, Jackson and John Jules all go off for Harness, Edwards and Depo. Um, and, you know, you want to you want your subs to make an impact akin to Charlton's um, subs. Um, talk to me about 28 minutes of Marcus Harness, one of you. Yes. Yeah, but... <laughs> the Harness... <laughs> Go, go on, Joe. I, I was only going to make the point that I know that I know you've already said about him. Yeah, but well, he doesn't seem to come in to come on as a sub and do well in games. As he's been, no. he's been a really good player when he started for us. But as subs, I don't know. Especially in that middle of the pitch, the game seems to be too quick for him when he comes on. And yeah, and that's what leads to that second goal where he's just that bit loose on the ball, isn't he? And he lets the ball sort of run across him, and then he gets another chance to take a touch and sort of tries to let it go. And Jimmy. Sort of shimmy past the man, but you cannot do that on the halfway line because when you lose the ball there, you've got six players going past you that way, and then and you're in trouble. And mm. we were in trouble, and it went right. And the guy cut in and was able to get a shot off. It was a pretty weak shot, pretty poor shot. And Walton should hold it easily, but he doesn't. And from sort of just being loose on the ball in midfield, it ends up 2 2. And I say Harness was loose a few times to the ball and also just sort of commits fouls as well, commits too many fouls in, in that situation when he comes on. And I say as a starter, he's been he's been brilliant for us. And but as a sub, he doesn't he doesn't seem to get into the game as quickly as some people do. Someone like Edwards, for example, comes on as a sub and affects the game quite quickly positively. Yeah. But Harness goes the other way for me. It's it's not the easiest position to come to come on. In is it Joe in that number ten position no. when when the opposition are pressing and they're they're trying to push high, but it, it, they were just sort of basic errors, weren't they? And he he slipped a couple of times as well, just didn't really seem to find 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 his bearings on the pitch at all. And and actually, ironically, he did he did start to play his part in the attacking stuff once it once it went yeah. to two two. But by then, I think especially yeah. it's a new role for him as well, isn't it? I think we forget that yeah. he's he's often been used as a wide player. For Portsmouth, and then when you're coming into the middle of the pitch, it is more congested in yeah, there in the, in the middle of the pitch. There is there is less time on the ball, and you, you mm. and if you lose the ball there, it's a much bigger deal. If you lose the ball there as opposed to on the touchline, yeah. And da Dan Connors's point there, sorry, Craig, to to step in. We really miss yeah. Aluko at those times. We absolutely do. Aluko, he's he's that point guard that can, to use the basketball term, he he slows the game down and then speeds it up when we need to. He he can dictate the play from an advanced midfield position. Harness is a lovely technical player and very elegant and makes nice runs and nice passes, but he he isn't that sort of tempo player, is he, in that position? Him, him and Chaplin can be quite frantic, can't they? As a, yeah. As two. yeah, when they're good, they're, they're, they're our best players, but when they're bad, they're well, you can then see why they're playing in League One, I suppose. Yeah. Well, Norman's asked here about bringing Humphreys on um, but then I suppose you, would you then be in, inviting Charlton onto you by bringing on another? Because at the time, it, it are you is two two, isn't it? Um, you're still good trying to to get the to get the win. You're not going to take either ball or Morsey off. I don't know. Maybe that's what. Um, I think suggests. it was a problem again, similar to the Sheffield Wednesday game, wasn't it? Where both our central midfielders had been booked, but yet you yeah. sort of have to leave them on and. They and Plymouth the same when and almost they they can't then make a tactical foul when they need to because they're they're both on that yellow and sometimes you just need to get a different player on there who can make the foul but maybe Humphreys isn't isn't the player for that. if if Evans was starting and Ball was on the bench maybe you then could do it that way yeah um so yeah there was a couple of minutes went past five or so minutes six minutes and then Carl Edwards had a an effort we were certainly you know putting the putting the pressure on weren't we and it, put, it fell to him on his left foot and. Unfortunately, just 
it was just a wild swing at the ball, wasn't it? He, he shanked it. Um, he had, high he had more time than he yards. realized, didn't he? But he's again, yeah. his eyes lit up, didn't they, Joe? Yeah, it was, I, I don't know whether they lit up or whether it was just like a pa- look of panic in his eyes, like a rabbit caught in the <laughs> yeah. headlights almost. It was just like yeah. it sat to him and he just almost seemed to panic and just swung a left foot at it when he had time to take a touch, didn't he? And just mm. score, really. But yeah, it, it, it was a, that reminded it was a really me good Joe, chance of poor effort. It reminded me of either if, if the Darren Curry chance that leads that time just because it was like late on in the game and he's just sort of snatched at it a little bit. Obviously, yeah. completely different circumstances and everything. Hopefully not as important. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, 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 got, it got to 91 minutes. And was this the, well, should it have been the Noel Hunt moment for the McKenna generation, Joe? Fantastic yeah. goal, wasn't it? It was a brilliant goal. Sort of Morsey has the ball in the midfield and Ladapo just sort of shapes sort of in the gap between the two midfields and brilliant pass from Morsey into his feet. And he just sort of takes a touch and just uses that sort of strength to sort of put it to one side and roll his man. And then just, like I say, unleashes a brilliant shot. And it's one of those ones in the away end. It's in from the moment it leaves his foot, isn't it? You see it from there and it just accelerates past the keeper's despairing dive. And it's just, mm. yeah, a brilliant strike, a brilliant goal. Looks like a man in in form now. He's now, mm. I say, there's been a lot of talk about the Dapo in here, but now he's he's a guy that's now scored seven goals this season, five in the league, and yeah, maybe it's not as many as he'd like or we'd like. But this is just what you want your striker to do, isn't it? Score you score you the goals when it matters, like he did on Tuesday, like he did last night. But no, great goal and the goal sort of fit to win any occasion, really. They're, they're the ones that they practice before the game, aren't they? And he t- he moved. He moved himself onto the centre half um, from his centre. He was in a really central position, and he quickly moves onto the centre half and points in that direction. But yeah, once he's made that turn, you've still got to finish it. And he d- he didn't even he didn't blink twice. Did he just wrapped his foot around it. That's his best goal since since signing for us. And you say, Joe, about you know it it being a goal from as soon as it leaves his foot. We we. Where we were, we couldn't see it hit the goal. We all we saw because of the, everyone was standing, the crowds there. We just saw him turn and hit it, and we saw it maybe a, a yard or so after it left his foot. And then, you, but even then, we knew where we were that it was it was heading in, and we just had to wait for the reaction from everyone more central to let us know. But the, mm. you know, it's just, and you can see it on the replay in the, um, on the clips that you've seen in the highlights. Now it's just a fantastic moment, isn't it, for the for the him as a as a player? You know, he's had a bit of a struggle to start with but the crowd just went and that's exactly what you want that's exactly why you go to these games and it's those sort of emotions and the mm. you know just the the i know we won't we all know how it ended up but you know that's they're, they're the things that you'll remember aren't they yes yeah definitely i'd say that's you just can't be the exhilaration of live football i i say i had like a smart watch on like a heart rate monitor and I looked at it after that I was like my heart rate's like 170 just watching the football <laughs> hit it's like unbelievable but yeah just there just hugging random strangers around you and just mm. yeah just a brilliant goal scenes I think is a term or limbs it was in that in that end there and it just like I say we are top of the league it was uh obviously it didn't turn out that way but it, it felt like it was a massive win didn't it at that point when that goal went in yeah, and it, and it, and you know that was and that victory was cemented what two or three minutes later, Mikey, and it was a slightly more subdued um, celebration because it was pretty much it, job done. You know, let's get yeah, out of here with three points. Yeah, everyone was still sort of struggling with their heart rate at that time, I think. But yes, yeah, th- this goal is at that stage of the game. You're just thinking, just just look after the ball, be sensible, play the ball into the corners when you can, try and win a few free kicks and stuff, but. It was just a really nice bit of um, passing and movement. It was Edmondson, I think, was sort of he was in front of the halfway line, plays it to Morsey, and then he plays the ball into Ball, and he just does a really nice turn. And considering that Ball had cramp on like the 70, 70 minute mark, he he had a really good spell and at, at two two up until up until four two. Yeah, as Jules says he looked knackered after sixty five minutes. Yeah, he was cramping up. But this bit of play was fantastic from him. Little triangle. And then Morsey, rather than running down the clock and not for the last time, just runs, mm-hmm. makes a run towards the box and it opens up a little bit, hits a shot and it takes a, quite a, a subtle deflection, which seems to accelerate the ball, if anything. And it flies into that near low corner. Um, yeah. And uh, one little detail that some people 
all the people that were behind the goal have noticed, but one that you might not realise when you're watching the highlights is when we scored our third goal in the absolute limb, somebody chucked their Ipswich scarf. scarf and it landed on the roof of the net. And that was still there when Morsey, Morsey struck the shot. Um, so that was an absolute thing of beauty as well. And I, yeah, I shook hands with the people around me and I was like, yep, I'm, I'm getting you guys on the screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I was literally skipping um, out of the ground at that stage. Um, yeah, a, a really nice goal. And I suppose in that position, some people would have been saying, go to the corner and Morsey didn't. He was positive. So yeah, fast forward a few minutes. Icing you... on the cake there, wasn't it? That goal, just the icing on the cake, just to top off a, a great London away day. Joe, two minutes later. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, two minutes later, it's uh, I can't even remember the, the third goal. Which one was that? Oh, it's that was one, one we... sort of free, sort of soft free kick given away in the middle of it. Was it Morsey? Yeah. I think gives it away. He doesn't really need to, and then just a long ball to the back of the box, and sort of win the win the first ball, don't they? And like I say, you look back at the replays, and Keo, who sort of has come on to sort of see the game out, seems to sort of let the ball just run across him, doesn't it? Roll across him and. Then I say it just goes to the near post and it's just slotted home and it's four free, but it, it didn't seem to affect the mood in the crowd, did it? And it does seem like when you listen to McKenna's sort of post match interviews and he's talking about sort of losing the emotion, like we just lost the battle of the emotions with ourselves. It did seem like the players, the crowd, when that fourth goal went in, it was just game over. And even like Morsey scores, he doesn't really celebrate them. And then sort of Keogh, the sort of most experienced player on the pitch, comes sort of dancing up there. And you've sort of got Keo, Don Ball and Sam Morsey, the sort of three people you'd expect to be the most sort of it's been there, seen it, done it, sort of players are the ones yeah, but doing you, the biggest if, celebration. If you, can't, if you can't celebrate oh, yeah, four not, two in the ninety fourth mm. minute, when can no, I'm you not, really? I'm not, not but like, but when it went four three, it didn't seem to even affect the fans at all. I, like, I didn't even think. I was just like, oh, okay, it's four three. We're going to win four three instead. But the mood of the whistle's going to blow sometimes. The so. mood of nothing changed when it went four three, didn't it? And I don't know. And it, and the game just started on again, and we sort of had the ball and we passed it about a bit and then Morsey had the ball and drove forward into the box and, and uh, yeah, like I say, rather than go to the corner when it's got sort of him and a Dapo two against one, he, um, he sort of heads in to try and beat his man and loses the ball. But again, my mate next to me was like, oh, what's he doing there? He should just go to the corner. I think, well, whistle's going to go any sec now. I wouldn't worry. It's not like Charlton mm. from that point on lumped the ball forward, is it? If you think that, oh, look, yeah, <laughs> no. there's a picture like Morsey yeah. from that point on. 30, 30, 40 seconds later, the ball's in the back of our net. But Charlton didn't seem to have any urgency, did they? They just were knocking the ball about, waiting for a cross position. Like I say, when you look back, when we talk about the sort of Coventry game where Pablo scores in the last minute, they equalise the last minute, it's literally like the ball goes back, one pass, launch forward, header flicked on, ball's with mm. him and it's goal. But it just wasn't like that. It seemed... No. I don't know. Like, I they know... played through the thirds, really, didn't they? For the yeah, and, and the fair play to them for sticking to their principles and things. But yeah. it does make you think with regards to with regards to f- football and the timing. It's all so haphazard, isn't it? Just the ref decides how much time he's going to allow. That's a minimum they can play until they want to play to. Where when you look at other sports, it is done to the second. You know when the game is going to end and it ends at that point. And I say there's so it's just so on a whim, isn't it? It almost seems from the ref, how much time they're going to allow when we end up playing. Like I say, the goal goes in eight, nine minutes into stoppage time. Yeah, there should be time added on, but there never is normally, is there? It's sort of hmm. No, but I just wonder if there was the uh, exaggerated celebrations, which, you know, just the referee decided that um, he'd had a, a bit extra on. But then as you say, Joe, that the, after that Morsey um, chance, where again, pretty much carbon copy, of of the goal, um, there was still a chance. There was still an, an opportunity when I think Don Ball it was heads the ball back 20, 30 yards to Walton, who takes his time again. This this yeah. is just eating into the clock. You think well, it's going to blow some point um, mm. in the near future. And there was it was a, it was a long time um, long time coming. But the ball broke again to our friend Anike on the halfway line, didn't it, Mikey? And again, he does he does very well. Yeah, he does. Um... Yeah, and that, that's what I had written down on my notes as well, is because obviously I was watching it for the first time when I um, rewatched um, Injury Time. Um, I, you could just see that we panicked a little bit, and I think first Morsey sort of fails to make a tackle. Obviously, he was on a booking as well, unsurprisingly. 
ball is sort of shrugged off by Nico, who's, mm, who's running at pace. And then we've got five players. I don't know if you've got a screenshot of this one, but at that stage, we've got five players behind the ball and they've got, and he's got two players in front of him. Um, so he, he's quite patient, as Joe says, just sort of plays it to the nearest player to him. Harness sort of slips at that stage, which means that he can't block the ball or get there to make a tackle either. Eventually ends up with Albie Morgan. Um, he cuts inside and loops a really high cross. And Walton's really good at coming for these crosses, but this one was too deep. And Walton ends up three yards off his line, which is crucial. But you still expect Davis to win this header because... Davis is good at defending his his back post. He's very strong in the air, but he gets stuck under the ball. And it's a it's a good header from from Dobson, but it, he just loops it back in the air. He's just trying to redirect it towards the goal. But because Walton has taken those three steps off his line, I'm sure Oscar wouldn't have done this. Craig, the ball ends up looping over over him. And if you look at the bit of the like bit of the goal where the ball goes in, it's literally like right in the middle of the goal. Um, mm. Mid, medium height. So if Walton yeah. did, if, if he stayed home, he's catching it. He's catching not even it. conceding a corner. Yeah. Um, but there we go. I said yeah. these, th- these things happen. They don't happen very often, do they? And it's a, it's a complete freak. And hopefully, as I've said already, hopefully this is one that we can look back on and laugh um, come what may. But yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, as Nick as Nick says here, you know, it's it's well, maybe not once a lifetime, but once in a Generation. hopefully once in a 10, 20 year period. That you know, that's a question for everyone else. Can you think of a? I can't think of a game like it. You know, with I was at the original. I say it's the original. The the four four Charlton game um, in ninety one was it ninety ninety one um, around Christmas time I think um, that was at Portman Road obviously, but you know, in terms of to and fro and timings and that there's there can't be anything anything approaching that certainly not from a being emotionally invested in it you know as well the the highs and lows were just absolutely ridiculous in this in the stands mm. weren't they as you say Joe, there were uh, where we were it was just complete strangers hugging each other and throwing each other around there were grown men falling downstairs and coming back with ripped jeans after the, <laughs> the dapo gold and stuff like that you think men with their tops off yeah. I had a, you know, a couple of quick photos of that, but um, <laughs> yeah, like there's, there's, but there's someone sit behind me, and it's sort of like a guy, guy I sort of speak to, but he's sort of older than me, just business guy, sort of does all that, and he ends up taking his shirt off to swing it around his head to celebrate. And I'm thinking, I know you've had a few beers, but well, calm down, mate. But no, it's just I say, and, and I guess the thing with like London away days is when they're really bad, they are really bad, like Charlton last year, mm-hmm. and when they're really good, they're really good. Like yeah. Charlton this year, up they're until the most extreme, sort of extreme games, aren't they? There's no in sort of middle ground in a London no. away day with the sort of fans that go there. No, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, as I say, there's a few comments here about players and and performances. So Lee is saying that Walton should have done better for both of, of those guys, and you know, the certainly one he spilt out um, as well. But then, as Jules points out, you know, he's he's allowed the occasional, uh, occasional bad day. Yeah. Um, Right. Okay. So, I'll just say, please put some comments. I've, I've highlighted a few that have been coming in, questions and bits and pieces like that. But just quickly to to re- refer to the post match comments from the from the managers, as you, as you said earlier, Joe McKenna pretty much pointed to a lack. It wasn't a lack of concentration and, and not sloppiness. He just thinks that we got lost control of our emotions. Really, um, I think that's like in even Robinson. the coaching staff as well as the players as well. When you see how the bench reacted yeah. to the goals. I'm not saying McKenna because I, I, I couldn't pick them all out individually and I'm sure he didn't, but one of them was like coming belly flopping onto the pitch, wasn't it? I don't know. I think it was Rene Gilmartin, but I can't yeah. say for definite. So I think they, like I say, it was a total, the the fans, the players and the coaching staff all reacted in exactly the same way, didn't they? But yeah. I say 99 times out of 100 when you go two goals up in injury time. <laughs> That, and that it, is, yeah. that is and it, thing, isn't it? Yeah. And the thing is, is if we do hold on, that's the sign of t- the togetherness and and the good side of it, isn't it? So yeah, we can't have it. Well, as as Norman says ways. here, he says we keep conceding the same type of goals. We need to improve our defending from crosses and set pieces, and that is something that McKenna referred to as early. He said that there's there's a common theme. If there is a common theme, then it's dealing with high balls into our box. Teams are mm. going to target us from are targeting us on that from here on in um, as they have done all the way along because of how we play. We've got winter coming up and we have to stand up to that. We'll be looking to do the work well, on the training ground. 
But we also need to recognise that it's a one out of a hundred finish to a game, which I think is pretty much what we, the way we're sort of seeing it. I think. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you think the defending of crosses, um, Joe? Obviously, some some of them are set pieces, um, but do you think teams are targeting us and and putting more crosses in, and they're getting the opportunity to down our right now because of Burns playing slightly higher up the pitch? Possibly, I don't know. It's difficult. It's difficult to tell, isn't it? I, I just think we're so difficult to play against. Most sort of we we defend very well generally in open play. That the only real way through is just frustration. We, just, we funnel everything there, and it's just slinging high balls into the box. There's no sort yeah. of craft or guile or anything to it. It's just slinging long balls into the box and hoping you can win that first header, isn't it? And when you win that first header, you're in a better position. And like I said, I've seen there's a few. Talking about Cameron Burgess here, would you put Burgess back in the team? But it's not really the centre backs that are losing the headers, is it? It's more the, mm. it's more the balls out sort of over Leaf. Maybe it's Greg Lee we're missing when we're sh- shutting down yeah. games at the end of the games, because Leaf Davis is, is basically playing left back, left midfield, left wing on his own. He's up and down yeah. that pitch, and every game this season, yeah, Greg Lee was the one coming on playing the last sort of 15, 20 minutes when. Leif Davis was to sort of use a Mick McCarthy term, goosed, wasn't he? And you'd yeah. get Greg Lee on there to to pick the bits there and maybe he's winning those headers, but it doesn't seem like like when you see Edmondson sort of for the goal, he's getting spun out on the touchline. Well, that's not somewhere where Cameron Burgess is going to come in and prove you, is it? He's 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 brilliant in those games where there's a lot of high balls coming in against us, but it's not you don't really get many you don't get that many games like that, do you? And I think it's sort of addition by subtraction having Wolfenden and Edmondson there because they allow us to play on the front foot. They allow us to push up the pitch and, and and you lose that, don't you, if you take one of yeah. those out of the team. But yeah. I say I'm looking forward to Burgess coming back being back available and coming back into the team and trying to play in the sort of horses for courses when it's needed. But I say I'd, I'd say we keep bringing Keo on to see out these games, but that doesn't really seem to be working. It seems that it confuses things having yeah. him having an extra body on there because we ended up with sort of Danassian right Wing back, Keo wing back, right, yeah. right full back, and you sort of lose a bit of that pace on that side there. So I don't, I don't yeah, know, and you do, you lose the ability one, to you lose the ability to stop the game further up the pitch, don't you? If you're invite, you're pretty much inviting the opposition to attack you more by yeah. adding more defenders. And as a de- as a defender, it's a nightmare changing positions as well that late on in the game because you do because you 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 just, it's sort of muscle memory. You know exactly where you need to be. You know you know what side of your man you need to be on. Who who you're switching to depending on where the ball is. And that all sort of goes out of the window when you bring on that extra defender. Yeah. Yeah. Not a, not a sort of area that I'd sort of consider to sort of not played those sort of positions. But yeah, when, you, when you're moving about, it's just little changes there. And it's like, mm. when it's just a couple of set pieces to defend, yeah, you just want an extra tall player in there, don't you, effectively, yeah. to try and win those first balls. But I, say, I, I, I think sometimes, I know we've sort of dropped two goal leads three times effectively in this week. But then we have we have had four four um points from those two away games. Yeah, we yeah. let Port Vale back into the game, but then we went and won the game after that. And effectively mm. we let Charlton back in, but we still went and won the game after it. And and I know we didn't because it happened. But that's say I I don't know, you, you, there's too much of I think there's maybe too much of an issue of the sort of defensive issues at the moment because when you look at back at us last season, yeah, we defended brilliantly, but there was a lot of nil nils and one ones in there. We we weren't winning games where if you look, we've got the best goal difference in the league. We're picking up sort of well over two points a game, aren't we, at the moment? And we could lose our next well, we could lose our next two games and still be two points a game, I think, or basically two points a game. So yeah. it's just uh I, I think, think uh, with, in, with in most... the way that after last week, when we only scored one goal against Derby, the attack was a problem. We've conceded goals this week, and the defence is a problem. But ultimately, we've picked up what sixteen points in seven games in October, and that's that's including some tough games in there. When when you look around us, we are. I say, everyone would have taken where we are at the moment, wouldn't you? Hmm. Yeah. As ever, it's saying all these things. You got you got you've got to try and just take a slightly wider perspective, longer view of it, haven't you? Rather than taking everything in one match chunks or two match chunks. You just got to try and, I know it's difficult, everyone, but try and just take mm. a step back and look over it. And if it does become more of a habit and we are conceding or dropping two goal leads and, and opposition are coming back in, into it and we start panicking like, you know, we did do yesterday, then yeah, by all means, you know, we can 
we can have a real conversation about it. Just a quick one about Ben Garner. I can't believe Ben Garner's going to be seen on the touchline for a, for a little while because after the match, he he went full double down um, and basically accused the referee of playing for Ipswich and having to play against, you know, having a, have a comeback against 12 men. Um, he said here, to do that against 12 men, which is what it was, makes me so proud of the players and supporters. The officials need to take a look at themselves it was like being back at school with the fourth official. Every time I tried to speak to him, it was like a kid going, saying he was going to tell his mum about you. Just stand up and have a conversation and be a man, said Ben. It's probably a ban and a fine. Yeah, I think, Ben, you're probably right. It will be a ban and a longer ban and probably a, a more, an increased fine than he would have got if you had just kept your mouth shut. Um, he hasn't exactly ri risen above it, has he? <laughs> No, that's it. He, no, because he, because it is annoying when referees don't talk to you properly. Yeah, and I dismissive. can get that. But then he's already saying the Ipswich are playing with twelve men, which is also really irritating, um, and it just unhelpful. But apparently, Charlton fans really aren't 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 sold on him, and and oh, the really? way things are going, at, yeah, and tra training methods are being questioned as well. Like a couple of the players that they brought on near the end, apparently, are two of Charlton's best players um but neither of them can play longer longer than half an hour due to fitness issues yeah so yeah they're not they're not sold them at all oh that's interesting well as, as joe said you know maybe that's the whole theatrical dismissal and wander off down the touchline it's just yeah. to carry favor and to you know be seen as uh, trying to get some sort of um, propaganda going and yeah. back himself up and it's, to be fair at two nil down you've got nothing to lose really have no. you? and and it and it did sort of ignite the Charlton fans as well. Yeah. Um, it, and we ignore the fact that they turned, rocking, they, turned, but... and they turned it around with him nowhere near the pitch. Yeah, they, have, yeah, they scored four, four, goals four goals in his absence, <laughs> yeah. didn't they? <laughs> yeah, exactly that. Right, well done. We got through it. Um, and as as expected, it, you know, we're, we're approaching the hour now and we haven't even talked about other results and, and tables and bits and pieces like that. So hopefully if people are willing to, to stay with us, we'll... We'll go through um, other bits because there were other games in in uh, League One yesterday. Not that I watched any of them because uh, I haven't been interested in watching much football since about <laughs> five o'clock um, <laughs> yesterday afternoon. But we'll quickly go through it because there were some. Oh, let me get rid of Michael's. Sorry, get rid of Michael's comment. Uh, 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 bear with me. There we go. Sorry, because um, there was a quite a couple of interesting results. Um, mate, well, I saw that there was unbelievably some Twitter beef between uh, Barnsley striker James Norwood and Forest, Forest Green Rovers um, fans for some reason. No idea why. Ex-player and all that. Um, but Barnsley back to winning ways, winning 2-0. Bolton got beaten at home by Oxford United, whether that's a start of a very late and probably um, unrewarded turnaround from uh, Carl Robinson at, at Oxford. Um, Derby County, that was the one I wanted to talk about. David McGoldrick, his first ever hat trick, apparently. First ever professional hat trick. So nice goals good for as him. well. All Were the they? first half. Mm. Yeah, so it was the first half. Lovely stuff. Well done. Well done, Diddy. Um anything else there that um jumps out for you guys? Apparently, obviously Barry Bannon scoring and setting up at least one goal for Sheffield Wednesday. Fleetwood are quietly going about their business, aren't they? They seem to be getting a decent result most weeks. And free at home to act from Stanley's obviously a very good result. Yeah. yeah, Scott Brown, his it... first job there, isn't it? And he seems to. Yeah. yeah. Um, Eric, Eric Clapton's picked out Pompey, says Pompey are not playing up. Yeah, I think they're struggling, even though they're in the playoff places. Lost, yeah, I think like they've drawn four. their last four home games, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think Joe Piggott got, I think, 10 minutes, um, the last 10 minutes for those guys uh, yesterday. Um, but the. Results of all those results is that uh, we still find ourselves in second place. Obviously, it's Exeter, Plymouth tomorrow night in some sort of I don't know, pasty scone derby. I don't know what they call it down there. Um, <laughs> it's the, the cream before the jam against the jam before the cream, is it? I, I don't know. The clotted cream derby. Um, yeah, so three points ahead of Sheffield Wednesday. Um, the gap to... The seventh is now 13 points, so um, almost insurmountable, you would sort of hope at this stage of the season. Um, but yeah, again, Plymouth's home record there is pretty stupendous, isn't it, at the moment? 
play date one I looked, eight. I, yeah, I looked at the um, sort of the full ninety two yesterday for sort of the points per game for teams, and there's seven teams in the sort of in the ninety two that are going along at more than uh, two or more points per game. You've got three in League One in Plymouth, Ipswich, and Sheffield Wednesday. Three in the Premier League in Spurs, Arsenal, and Man City, and then one in League Two. So it's just looking like that it's going to end up one of those seasons where you've got three teams going for two. They all look like they're going to get eighty-eight points, don't they? And if you lose that shootout, you like I say, it's just, it's just, you, just you can see it coming now, can't you? Like we're going to, we're going to get ninety points and sort of. <laughs> And we'll and all look still, back on that and still be looking over our shoulder on the end of the season. Yeah, and we'll all be looking at that, that Carl Edwards chance that you said wasn't going to be such a big issue after all at the end of the season. Thinking had he just <laughs> side footed it, stroked it into the corner, would all be, be a lot more twists and turns. Don't worry, they yeah. certainly will. Um, uh, sorry, Craig, just it, we we can't let Michael Warner's um, gag about the Plymouth Exeter derby escape, can we? Sorry, mate, I was I was looking to. Um, Right, I'm not even going to say it. So if people if people want to review it, watch back on YouTube because Michael that doesn't even deserve being mentioned. I think if, if people can enjoy it by reading it and making their own minds up. Um, what I was going to do, Mikey, was um, just highlight where Cheltenham were in the division because it's our next home game uh, yes. in the league. Um, they're currently in nineteenth. By the way, post Cheltenham is the Blue Monday live show. Um, eight o'clock in the Sir Bobby Robson suite, I believe. Um, tickets available, Blue Monday ITFC.co.uk. Be good to see you there. I think we're all in uh, attendance. Maybe Ben um, may struggle because he's on telly and all that uh, jazz. Yeah, I heard that the, ven- the venue choice was the talk of the away end yesterday. Yeah, no comment. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I've done my. Done my plugs for the for the time. Other news: Elkin Baggett, I think, played ninety minutes for Gillingham. El Mazzuni played ninety minutes for uh, for Leighton Orient. Um, Who are flying? It's good to see. It's good to see um, El Mazzuni back. He got injured, I think, a couple of games ago. So great to see him back in there because he seems to be having a really impressive loan spell there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think hopefully we've uh, we've done justice to what was a a topsy turvy. Um, up and down emotional roller coaster. Um, and as Matt says here, you know, if it finished 2 2, we'd be disappointed, but feeling much different, much differently about it. The manner of the finish changes that. But perspective, people, we've taken seven points from the last nine. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a point away um, at Charm, which is a point more than we got last year. And we didn't have, there were no central defenders arguing with um, fans at the end of the match, were there? As far as I no. yeah. no can I, can, I, the can I ask you a quick question, Craig? Would would you have rather have it ended 2-2 or 4-4, having enjoyed the euphoria of that 3-2 goal from the Dapo and the 4-2 from Wolsey? 4-4 every yeah. day of the week, surely. Yeah, yeah just give it something to talk about as well. Yeah, it? absolutely. Exactly that, you know, and, and you know, yeah. I refer to my little, little boy, Crust, my 14 year old again. This is the first time he's had that sort of emotion, proper emotion at a full match. Mm. Thing. Everyone's screaming their heads off, everyone's all over each other. And also that complete and utter demoralization when the, the fourth goal goes in. You know, it's yeah. I said to him, I was saying to him on the way on the way home, you know, if nothing else, you'll always, always remember it. Which, mm. you know, I think yeah. every anyone who's there will do. And you know, yeah, at was, the end of the day. Hopefully, come May when we've got promotion, we'll look back and think, "Bloody hell, do you remember that bloody game at Charlton? What a ding dong that was!" And yeah. it'll just form it was, part it an, of the story of the season. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it was an "I was there" moment for the two thousand nine hundred ninety nine Ipswich fans in that away end, um, and an "I was not there" moment for me and most of the Charlton <laughs> fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but well, my, know, my my. my... Lift said to me, "Oh, should we go it when it's four to us?" And now we've got to stay for the celebrations. And then, obviously, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Well. I've enough of them. <laughs> I was worried my top was going to come off as well. Yeah, as as Flim as Flim Flam says here, twenty years of supporting it, which condensed into uh, into ninety nine. Well, almost condensed into the last nine minutes, let alone the the previous uh, the previous ninety. Um, well, I say, I think. Well, hopefully that's that's us that's us done. Hopefully we've done it justice. Hopefully we haven't you know demoralised anyone too much. I think we pretty, pretty much kept it upbeat and 
as um, grown up and unhyperbolic as as we possibly can. Um, in terms of bits and pieces this week, I believe we're going to have a, a live Q and A on Wednesday. Um, there being no um, midweek match this week, um, and crikey, what best wishes to um, to Seb this week leading up to the the cup match at the weekend um he's going to be going full really in depth on um our opposition uh in the fa cup first round on monday um so i think that's going to be friday whether it's live or not i don't know as yet so you know keep keep your eyes peeled but it'll be on it out and on at the normal time on um on friday um and I think that's that's pretty much us done. I don't know if we've decided what we're going to do next Sunday because obviously it'll be before the uh, before the match, won't it? But um, so hopefully we've yeah all become clear. Just keep oh. keep your eyes peeled on the Ipswich yeah Town Twitter. Yeah, exactly that. Blue Monday Twitter. Even can I just give a quick shout out to my swing coach Julian Julian Hughes because I I had a win today in a golf competition. It was foursome, so I needed half the work. But yeah, shout out to Jules. Fantastic video golf coaching. I wonder where you're going to go when you start talking about swing coaches, mate. I thought you were talking about pampas grass and, and all that sort of... Uh, <laughs> get a I do live get in the suburbs. In your front window. <laughs> <laughs> well, on, on, that, on that note, well, I'd say, yeah, hopefully we can, we can all now get on with our week. And, you know, if not, call the club and, and get a... Um, a one-to-one session with Mr. Yellow Shoes. I'm sure he'll uh, he'll be. He's going to have a busy week, isn't he? This week, I think mm. he'll be able to put you straight. Um, yes, thank you, thank you, Mikey, thank you, Joe. Really enjoyed that, and I say hopefully we've uh, we've managed to put a smile on some people's faces on, on in what was a pretty dark time at about five o'clock yesterday afternoon. Thank you to you both for your time. Um, I think it just leads me to say, yeah, we'll go again next week, and we'll. Um, See you Wednesday night for a, for a live Q&A. Thanks for all your input, everyone. Thanks for your questions and your comments. Appreciate that as ever. And we'll see you soon. Cheers. Good night.